Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, State Hawaii State Energy Office. Gives me great pleasure to introduce today my guest. Oh, he's Howard Wig. I'm doing a solo show today. And it is about revolution. When we think revolution, French Revolution, off with their heads, let them eat cake, didn't turn out so well. Napoleon, followed by some mediocre royalty after that. How about the Russian Revolution? I have a good Joseph Stalin for you. How about the Chinese Revolution? How many millions was Mao responsible for killing? Those are political revolutions, little on the bloody side, and generally speaking, cause suffering just of unimaginable lengths. But what I'm talking about is technological revolutions. Thomas Edison, the incandescent light bulb, changed the way America, and not just America, but the whole world lived. Speaking of which, little side note, what building was the first building west of the Rocky Mountains to be lit with incandescent bulbs? Iolani Palace. King Kalakaua was a great uh, traveler, and he went to the Paris World Fair, believe it was 1880, and there was Thomas Edison showing off his brand new incandescent light bulb. The two became fast friends, and Edison arranged to have an electrician and the equipment sent to Hawaii, and voila, Iolani Palace was uh, lit before anywhere in uh, California was lit. And then there's Henry Ford and the automobile revolution. Need, But both of those took decades and decades to come to fruition. Today we are going through electronic revolutions, best illustrated by the iPhone. Fifteen years ago, iPhones did not exist. Now they exist seemingly permanently glued to the hands of every young person, and I have the good fortune to hang around in uh, United clubs at different airports, and those clubs are inhabited by well-to-do, mature, seemingly very rational people, and they're glued to their iPhones also. Revolution in lifestyle. And the iPhone and the other computer equipment are uh, governed, of course, by Moore's Law, which says that the capacity of a computer-like equipment shall double every 18 months, and the cost shall drop by half every two years, and it's pretty well coming true. The same goes for the LEDs, which is governed by Hate's Law, H-A-I-T-Z, a Roland Hate's American scientist, back in the year 2000, said in every 10 years, the efficacy, the miles per gallon of the LED is going to go up by a factor of 20, and the cost in that 10 years is going to go down by a factor of 10. In other words, they become much more efficient, they become much cheaper in 10 years, a blink of an eye, and lo and behold, that has come true. In five years, certainly 10 years, all you will see is LEDs, LEDs, LEDs. Why is that? There is a number of reasons that we will go through today. But first, a brief review of the two most common lights that uh, we grew up with, the incandescent, which is Thomas Edison's invention, and all you do with an incandescent is punch a whole bunch of electrons into a skinny little tungsten wire. The tungsten wire is resistive. It glows with heat, and that glowing heat is what gives the light. A little side note on the incandescent, 
I was demonstrating one some years ago when incandescents were still around and I had a heat gun. And Senator Will, what's his, Will Espero was in the audience and I asked him to aim the heat gun at the tip of the incandescent light and he got 465 degrees Fahrenheit. Hotter than blazes, you literally can set fires with incandescence. At which point, I asked the audience, who wants a whole bunch of mini ovens in their Hawaii homes? We don't need any more heat in Hawaii homes. And then there were the fluorescents. The fluorescents that uh, we grew up with were very heavy on the blue side. I'll, I'll actually get into the details about that. But even though the fluorescent lights are much, much, much improved from the ones we grew up with, they can't hold a candle, pun intended, to the LED lights. How can LEDs be really, really useful? Number one in health facilities, especially care homes. You have frail elderly people who rarely get outside and their circadian rhythms, their rhythm of sleep and wakefulness would get all messed up. Enter the LEDs. When the staff wants the inhabitants to wake up, they start lighting gently, gently in the same light color as an early sun, and they gently, gently ramp that up, getting more and more blue into that light until you have, by the middle of the day, a simulation of full daylight. And then towards evening time, they begin to emulate sunset. So these inhabitants are living on the same rhythm that uh, the rest of us are, who are fortunate enough to be able to go outside all the time. And this has vastly improved the well-being, the, the uh, orientation, the good orientation of these inhabitants because they're living in the same cycle, daily cycle, that we are. And the same goes for uh, uh, intensive care units. Now, how about schools? If you remember your adolescence, <clears throat> you probably remember that you had one heck of a time waking up for school. And that's because the hormonal shift in teenagers is such that they don't want to go to bed until around one in the morning. So of course you don't want to get up until about nine in the morning. School doesn't operate like that. There have been some proposals to start the school day a hour later <clears throat> to have mercy on uh, teenagers. But what you can do now with lighting in schools is have really bright light, heavy in the blue, it, right in the beginning of the classroom and then uh, the class day, and then shift it over to more uh, normal colors as the teenagers do indeed wake up. Here's a little uh, side note for you, no extra charge. Do not have blue lights in your bedroom. You know, all those little blue indicator lights that are on the electronic gadgetry. Blue is the stimulating color and it forces down the melanopsin, the hormone that causes us to be sleepy. So that we stare at the blue light, we're not sleepy. And again, the way to wake people up in the morning is to have uh, plenty of uh, blue light there. So the idea there is to ideally have daylighting in your schools because kids perform a lot better under daylight. Which brings me to the subject of CRI, Standard Cocktail Party Conversation Material, Color Rendition Index. What in the world is that? That is where you measure the human eye's response to colors by taking an ideal outdoor setting. Why outdoors? 
because our ancestors, the Homo habilis, who've been around for probably 7.2 million years, they're the ones who started walking upright in the African savanna. And when you're upright, your visual needs are different than when you're up in trees. And our eyes began to evolve to maximize survival in that atmosphere or that environment. And we still have those eyes maximized for survival and the sense of well-being. So 100 CRI is the ideal daylit environment. The fluorescent lights that we grew up with, the old-fashioned ones had a CRI of about 0.6, or emulated only 60% of the outdoor light not good for us. And back then, if a clothing store or a restaurant had in the ladies' bathroom those old-fashioned fluorescent tubes. Ladies would put on their makeup. Hmm, I need a lot of makeup here. And go out and into an incandescent environment and look like painted ladies. Why? All that blue was washing the red out of the makeup. Speaking of which, regardless of our ethnic background, our skin tones are very, very heavy on the red end. And what would these blue fluorescents do? They would wash a lot of that red out and make us look pretty sickly. Enter LEDs. You can mix the three primary colors. You'll remember our red, blue, green, and all other colors are a mixture of those three. You can mix them and match them any way you want so that you can pretty well emulate the human eye's response to daylighting. You can have virtually the same type of light. You remember that way over on the left is violet, and the human spectral response is in a bell-shaped curve. So you go from violet to blue to dark green, lime green, right up on the top. Then you go over to the yellows orange, red, and deep red. And so you can mix and match in LEDs anything you want to accommodate that. And getting a CRI of 0.9 now, 90% accurate in terms of daylight, is very, very uh, common. And you can, uh, the sense of well-being under a high CRI light is much better. For one thing, you, you look uh, natural. So what about LEDs in restaurants? Again, you can set the mood. You might want a, a brightly colored, rich blue environment at lunchtime when people are getting their business done. But towards the evening for dinner, you might want to go over to much more relaxing light. And say there's a, a club scene after that, you can Flash blue. Remember, blue is a stimulating country, uh, color. You can flash the blue all over the place and get a, a, a nice, stimulating, exciting atmosphere. Speaking of exciting, the people who have taken the best use of outdoor LEDs, in my humble opinion, have been, have been the Chinese. You go to Shanghai, other big Chinese cities, and you will see whole buildings with crisscrosses of different colored lights shaping the building and misshaping the building and then shifting from purple to red to pink to green. You can do anything you want with these LEDs. And on that very cheery note, we need to take a brief break. Howard Wig, State Energy Office, Code Green, back in a minute. Hi. I'm Ethan Allen, host on Think Tech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. I'm Jay Fidel of Think Tech. Come around every Tuesday at 2 p.m. with John, David, Ann, and me. We're talking about history, history lens. Right, John? Exactly. Seeing current events through the lens of the past. Absolutely.
See you next time. Okay, Jay, thanks. <laughs> Aloha, I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahei every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii who joins us from time to time to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us every other Monday. Aloha. Good afternoon again, Howard Wig, Code Green, Hawaii State Energy Office. Now, where were we before I was so rudely interrupted? Let's go to sports lighting. LEDs have become more and more and more powerful. And again, as I talked about color rendition, you can have any color rendition that you want. And the TV production guys are very, very fussy about color. And again, you can dial it up any way you want for basketball, football, whatever. And now, in these big stadiums, you have what's called a light throw of, say, 150 feet. By George, these teeny little LEDs can throw that far very effectively. Now, let's look at the energy implications of sports lighting as the event it, say it's a couple of hours before the event, you have the entire stadium at half light, say it's an evening event, or even one third light, because all you need is enough light for people to safely find their way to their seats and get their hot dogs and, and their beer or whatever. Then the event starts. You can dim the spectator part of the stadium but you still need certainly enough light for safety, but your light is really, really focused on the playing field. And you have full cutoff, which means you can almost draw a, a fine line as to where this bright light is and where it's not. And so this, this uh, increases the contrast between the dark, darkish spectator area and the brightness of the playing area and makes for a much more uh, visually acuitous and exciting lighting uh, atmosphere. And then when the playing is over, you go back to half light because you, you just don't need that much light. And then later when the janitorial crews are cleaning everything up, you might go down to quarter light because you just don't need much visual acuity to pick up uh, pieces of paper and so forth. So you can make sports lighting more exciting and give it a, and take advantage of the flexibility of the LEDs to save tons of energy. We'll, we'll go into uh, that later. What about the implications for other type of outdoor lighting, namely street lights? As you possibly know, the state government which controls the major highways, the harbors, and the airports, has converted to LEDs with great, great energy savings. But they converted to what's called 4,000 K, and K means degrees Kelvin. If you, a Lord Kelvin in England, the 1840s, noticed that when you heated up a piece of metal, it started out with a reddish glow, and as it got hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, it went to a yellowish glow, orange glow, and oh, it started out red, and then went to orange, yellow, and then finally, really hot, it ended up blue. Counterintuitive, but that's exactly what it did. So we measure the color of light now in, in degrees Kelvin, and the state chose 4,000 degrees Kelvin, which is heavy in the blue, very, very bright. The city, by contrast, they're converting also, has done the, their major highways, say, Baratania, King, in 4,000K, but all of the residential streets are in 3,000K, which is heavier on the red side and is much more relaxing for our eyes and is much more uh, relaxing in, in terms of, um, again, the circadian rhythm. 
it's easier to get to sleep in a neighborhood that's lit by 3,000K rather than 4,000K. So let's get to the economics of LEDs. Now here's where it really hits a home run. You measure the efficiency, the miles per gallon of lighting in terms of LPW. What's that? Lumens per watt. Lumen is the light. Measuring the light output, what is the power input? The old incandescent light. I hope you don't have any more incandescent lights in your house. Oh, and let me do a sidebar here. And you're going to say, oh, but the LEDs are so bright. And what you mean is they're so heavy on the blue end of the spectrum. No, you can get LEDs in any degrees Kelvin you want. The old-fashioned incandescent is 2,700 LED or uh, degrees Kelvin. You can get 2,700 indoor LED lights. So that's, that is no longer an argument. So they get these old incandescents about 15, 15 lumens per watt. The fluorescents that we grew up with up in the ceilings were about 60 lumens per watt, only they had something called ballast, which drove them down to about 50 lumens per watt. The new fluorescents are much, much improved. They're up around 100, 105 lumens per watt now. What are LEDs? Common off the shelf LEDs now, 120 lumens per watt. I just saw one company offering LEDs at 155 lumens per watt, and just this morning, another manufacturer came out with 201 lumens per watt versus 15 lumens per watt for the incandescent. So the efficiency, or what we call efficacy, is totally, totally off the chart. Now. Let's transfer that to, well, let's, oh, here's the economics. The LEDs do cost more than incandescents, but there's an outfit called Hawaii Energy, and they are the rebate people. They want you to buy energy-efficient refrigerators, washing machines, and so forth, and certainly lighting. And they work with the retail establishments to bring down the cost of the LEDs. I think the retail establishments are supposed to have uh, credit to Hawaii Energy for reducing your costs. They often don't uh, do that, but Hawaii Energy isn't uh, too insulted. But they work with the larger firms to get rebates for the LEDs, which, again, according to Hate's Law, are coming down in cost very, very uh, dramatically anyway. So if you even take a conversion, say in an office, from fluorescent lights, say they've got um, an older set would have about 80 lumens per watt, re or install LEDs, 125 lumens per watt, woo, nice, nice, nice economics, but there's more. There's something called luminaire efficacy. And that refers to the fact that when you have uh, fluorescence up there, the light is going out at 360 degrees. But you say, wait a minute, we only need light down on our task, on our table. Absolutely. So there's a reflective surface up on the top of the uh, LED or the fluorescent fixture which is reflective, and it beams the light back down, but there's a loss. And that loss is about 30%. So 100% light output here, only 70% of that gets down to the task. LEDs are directional, meaning you can direct all the light down in whatever <clears throat> color pattern you want. So your luminous or your luminaire efficacy is well over 90%. There goes more savings for you. And then you say, hmm, does that have anything to do with the air conditioning load? Indeed, it does. Because you will imagine an incandescent light, 465 
uh, degrees Fahrenheit, you can imagine what that does for the air conditioning load, and then you get to the fluorescence, much more efficient, but still they give off heat. LEDs, because of their low, low wattage, give off very, very little heat. Your air conditioning load can drop like a, watt, uh, like a rock. The general rule of thumb is that for every three watts of lighting that you can decrease, you decrease your air conditioning load by one watt. Let's look at that from the standpoint of Hawaiian Electric, where in the, we have a very peculiar, what's called uh, load profile, where during, in the morning, when everything is ramping up, the demand for electricity, this is statewide now, goes up quite high, and then we have all, we have jillions of PV photovoltaic panels out there, and especially on a sunny day, the demand will dip down, 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 and just as the sun is going away and the PVs are not effective, everybody's coming home from work and school. What's our main industry? Tourism, all the tourists are coming back from shopping, beach, whatever. They're going into their hotel rooms, everything's turning on, and then they go to the restaurants and the bars, and they're going full blast, and we have this evening peak. Now, and that's where Hawaiian Electric has to turn on some pretty inefficient power plants and reduces our, our all-over all efficacy of the uh, lighting pattern, or the whole electrical demand pattern. Now, what happens with LEDs? A large portion of all that electrical energy is, uh, is lighting, Boom, you've shifted that plus, as I said, you shift down your air conditioning load. So it makes life a lot easier, a lot more efficacious for Hawaiian Electric. And let me end with a pitch for 100% clean energy by the year 2045, the most aggressive efficiency pattern or tar target in the nation. Just shifting to LEDs in your home, office, school, everything takes us a long, long way towards achieving 100% clean energy by the year 2045. On that very, very cheery note, it, I bid fond adieu, Howard Wiggs State Energy Office, Code Green. See you next time.